All right, fantastic. So uh, welcome back to the uh, Bajeska Simpkin School for Human Rights. Um, today, we're doing something a little bit different. Um, first off, I'm not sure why everything looks so white in my background, but whatever. Anyway, um, today is, is different. We don't have a set schedule for today in terms of topics we're going to discuss. Instead, we want to use this time as a chance for feedback from you, our, our valued students and fellow comrades in arms. Um, because, you know, normally with the Majestic School, we have some breaks here or there, and if we were, yes, Daniel, you're welcome for the comrade usage there. Uh, normally we have some time to, in class, in person, to talk about some of the questions you guys have had in more in depth. Um, but today we want to give time to you guys to talk about what you've learned so far, um, and also, to give you a chance to learn more about what the Progressive Network is actually doing right now. Um, you you want to think about the fact that even though we're learning a lot of the history of South Carolina in this course, in the next few weeks, we're going to be transitioning from history to talking about the theory and strategy behind organizing. You do want to think about the fact that ultimately the goal here is to create more informed citizens and inform citizens who will be ready to become activists if they so choose to do so. Um, Brett, have anything to add to that before we get started? Well, um, I wanted to very briefly, if I can ever be very brief, to point out that, this is laughing at me, to point out that the Majeska School isn't something that's just kind of floating off on its own. The Majeska School uh, is our attempt um, garnished over my 50 years of work and my assimilation of what Majeska taught me and all the great people that I've worked with, to have an analysis of what the problems are and a theory as to where they came from, that they guide our practice. And so that's what the Majeska School is about. And so what you're learning in here about the way South Carolina laws and mores and customs have been made should be becoming clearer here that we now have this incredible opportunity to see uh, predatory capitalism undressed. And that, uh, for instance, I just, we've been, in 2008, I spent nearly eight months being the only civilian arguing for the state of South Carolina to utilize the nation's only publicly owned broadband system. The reason our state owns all six, 63 licenses of the broadband system was because they started at the same time in 1959, they were discussing closing the schools to avoid segregation. And so because of our racist history, we have a tool that could actually reach the 140,000 people that the Secretary of Education just did a press conference two days ago in South Carolina, uh, identifying these poor kids that can't get internet at home. And so what they're doing is they're driving buses that have Wi-Fi and parking them in the poor black areas, which are the places that they've identified. And so that's this, this now do you people get it? And so the opportunities for us to be ahead of the curve and prepare for, for the opportunity to drive home some things that we've been teaching about a, a predatory system uh, is ripe upon us. And so I just want you to know that the school is about more than just learning people's history. It's about how you sharpen your practices today for tomorrow. Thank you, Robert. All right, so with, um, with that being said, I, I wanted to go around the virtual room, so to speak, and the first thing I want to do tonight is to learn from you guys. What, what are some things that you've learned in this class so far that may have surprised you, you may have been enlightened by, you found to be particularly useful or fascinating. And then we also want feedback. What are some things you like to see done in the class? Uh, of course, we're not officially done with the class. We have a few classes left. Uh, we could certainly incorporate whatever uh, suggestions you may have in the classes to come or, you know, future sessions of the Majestic School. But we want to hear from you guys. You know, what have you learned so far? What did you find particularly fascinating about what you learned? And what would you like to see added or changed, if anything at all? Robert, call, call your, get your participants list up and just call names so people don't sit around waiting for somebody to say something. Oh, uh, well, let's see. Your participant list at the bottom of your screen, quick. Oh, I see it. 
so let's see. I'm just going to choose a random person. Um, okay. And this is, again, not picking on anybody. This is just a random selection. Um, so we are, I'm going to start actually with Jacob. Jacob, I'm just curious as to your thoughts about the class so far. Yes, sir. I've um, thoroughly enjoyed it and have learned so much. Um, a lot of the, the history I don't think came as a surprise as, as much as just, you know, a shock, you know, um, the details, but um, the reconstruction era just fascinates me. And, and the more I learn about that, the more um, I wonder how South Carolina as a state would be different had we continued um, in that regard. And um, it's just uh, amazing to see how far the other way we have gone in spite of uh, the rich history that we have there. Um, so yeah, that, that to me has, has stuck out the most, I believe. All right, yeah, I, I think for many people, the Reconstruction era in South Carolina is particularly of interest. And I'm glad you said that because I can recall a few years ago when I was a PhD candidate at USC, um, I remember reading in the Daily Gamecock that a student complained about learning Reconstruction history in several different classes. And it was clear to me that student wasn't really paying attention to the reconstruction lessons they were supposed to be learning because it's such a, a rich and fascinating time period of, of South Carolina's history. <laughs> um, all right, so let's see. Um, Cecil, I'm just curious, anything that you've learned in this class so far you, you were surprised by? Anything you'd like to see changed? Just curious as to your thoughts. Um, I'd bring up a couple of points. Not anything that has changed, no, when you ask is there anything that has changed. <clears throat> uh, I was hoping to learn, and maybe will still when we transition from the history to, to theory, more about the ideology, uh, the political theory and, uh, and practices that, uh, that were imported from the, uh, the English Barbadians to, to the founding of um, of Charleston and how that ideology was so different from the ideology of the English who settled at Jamestown. Uh, I understood that the 40 years or, or so that they spent, that these English spent perfecting the, the plantation system in Barbados was very different in practice from the, uh, from the social development of the, uh, of the Jamestown colony but I was hopeful and, and I'm still hopeful to hear more discussion about the, uh, the origins of that ideology. I understand that John Locke is, um, is important once we get to the 1660s and 70s, but something led in the 1630s and 40s, those English in Barbados to make the choices that they did. And, and I'm curious, the political, the theory, the ideological choices that they did, and I'm curious about, um, about what those source, what the sources were and, uh, and how they imported them. Um, because, and I ask that because it's my opinion that, uh, that those ideological sources, those roots that were planted in Charleston and that grew in South Carolina during its first century or so, grew in Carolina while it was still one colony were the roots of all of these negative political theories and, and strategies and tactics that infected the rest of the South and then leached outward to infect the rest of the country. Uh, so I'm fascinated by that. And I've, I've not found, there are a few volumes that I've taken a look at, but I've not found any that, uh, that are sort of easily accessible to the layman. The second point I'd make is that in the work that I do for NEA, when I go into a state affiliate in the South or a local affiliate in the South to begin working with leadership there on a project, we engage in what we call appreciative inquiry. We have a conversation about uh, important milestones and events in that state affiliate or that local affiliate's history over the last, say, 25 to 40 years or so. And we specifically ask the question, what worked well and why did it work well? 
Um, now I don't get sent it, sent into uh, local affiliates that are humming on all cylinders. I get sent into local affiliates that are that are missing a bunch of spark plugs, let's say. Uh, but even in the cases where they have faltered and atrophied, something worked well over the last generation to two generations. And so I ask those kinds of questions. So I ask, I would apply the same uh, tactic here, the, the tactics of appreciative inquiry and ask over the course of the last 300 years in South Carolina, when things did go in a right direction, why did they go in the right direction? And to what extent did they go in the right direction? And uh, that's why a couple of weeks ago when we covered very quickly the progressive era, I asked a question at the end about uh, the administration of Richard Manning and, uh, and looked for some examples because that to my mind is one sort of bright shining moment following the, uh, the reconstruction legislature and the accomplishments that they made of examples where things did move briefly in the right direction and, uh, and some elements of what was accomplished during those periods still live today, although they're on life support. That's all, Dr. Green, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, hmm, so let's see. I think going back to your first question about Barbados in particular, we, we do kind of delve a bit into that with the theory material that we do cover in the next few weeks. Um, but I will say one, one big thing I want to note right off the bat about why Charleston and South Carolina developed so differently from Jamestown Colony. Uh, part of it is what you've already mentioned, is that this was a place that was specifically designed to be a slave colony from the get-go. So right off the bat, development is going to be a bit different from, say, Jamestown or anywhere else. I would also add to that, though, those 40 years or so between development of Jamestown and development of South Carolina colony, or Carolina colony, rather, the big difference is that by the 1660s and 1670s, you're having essentially in England and the rest of Western Europe a greater development in ideas of racial hierarchy theories about how race is supposed to work that are closer to what we think of today in terms of modern race and modern racism. So to give you an example, um, historians have been arguing for years now, because if there's one thing historians have to do is argue about when you have the first Africans brought to Jamestown colony in 1619 or so, what were race relations like in the colony at that particular time? In other words, did the English have a view of black Africans as being always inferior? And see, there, there are some debates about if that really was the case or not. We know most of the folks brought to Jamestown in 1619 were in some form of slavery or servitude. Eventually, some do buy their freedom. They are able to purchase land, even purchase their own slaves. But by the time Carolina colony is founded in the 1660s, you are having a hardening of ideas about race in the British Atlantic, certainly, in both England and then Barbados and then in the North American colonies. And also you're having a hardening of ideas about race all across Western Europe. I think certainly John Locke and what he's writing, you know, in terms of Carolina's constitution is really important. But the context in which he is writing and the context in which African slaves are being purchased and sold. Um, it, it's still, the thing about North America in the, six, the 17th century is that African slavery coming into North America is really but a trickle compared to, say, Brazil or the Spanish Caribbean. But it is growing. And certainly the folks in Barbados, the English in Barbados, some would argue their kind of slavery, their outlook on slavery and race is actually closer akin to that of the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Caribbean than it is even to the English in, say, Virginia. Although in Virginia, it's also starting to kind of come closer to what it will be in Carolina Colony as well. Um, so that's, I'm glad you mentioned that because we do want to make sure as we go forward with the class that students get some of that context in from the early history of Carolina Colony, because as you mentioned, it is really important to have that context in mind, because it does help to explain uh, 
the state's continuing wrestling with, with racism because the state is essentially born in that, that kind of hierarchy. Um, now to, uh, Brett, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I see you. yeah before you go on to question two, yeah. um, Cecil, I just read recently, and I'll dig out the book and send you uh, um, information on it. I've been saying for a long time that first generation Barbadian, uh, second generation, second generation Barbadians were the ones that came here and started the Carolina colony. And it's, I'm now reading third generation. And that the difference very simply between what was happening up north and here is that up north, there was a sense, regardless of how that sense was driven, of people seeking freedom from whatever. There's a lot of discussion about religious freedom, freedom from King George, et cetera. So there was a different impetus for the travel. We're, we're having third generation of Barbadians that were raised at a time when they went to Barbados, not for freedom, but for money. And that they have a reputation, had a reputation of being the most brutal masters mm -hmm. because they were outnumbered terribly. Mm -hmm. And so they came here to this land of, of ours now for money. And they had a way of doing it that was pretty rough. And so that right there is a really coarse distinction that I think we can still see in effect today. So on to question two there, Cecil, so I thought that was very uh, perceptive and you called it um, appreciative inquiry. Right. There are several volumes on this in the field of study called organizational development that, uh, that, uh, that we use in the work that we do, appreciative inquiry. And you, um, is your question more on what we've been doing in the uh, last 50, 60, 70 years or going back further than that about appreciative inquiry? In the work that, in the work that I do with local affiliates, uh, I go back a generation or two. So let's say 25 to 40 years. But in the context of what we're talking about in the history of South Carolina, mm -hmm. I was hoping to get some of that in, uh, in, the, in the whole broad scope since 1670 of when things did go in a right direction, why did they go in a right direction, how far did they go in the right direction, and then why did they stop? We're, we do a good job of pointing out why things stop. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's much easier to point out why they stopped to count yeah. the guys with the guns. Um, and um, we'll have to get into the good things. I mean, I think we've touched on the, the different rebellions and, the, and the, the, hope, the, hope, the hope that carried on uh, that still burns in the you know hearts of people, but uh, it's it's been rough here. It's been rough here, and I can only testify for the last fifty years that I've been doing work in South Carolina, feeling like I'm just this side of a third world country, and that most of America doesn't understand it. And so um, I'm gonna have to sleep on the, the 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 things where we've been able to learn from the past. But I I do know that now uh, we are we are doing right now organizing. Uh, putting um, county committees in place around the state, working with the NAACP and their youth division, doing voter mobilization of the tiny percentage of, using the tiny percentage of black voters, 12% out of uh, 203,000 people that have actually voted. And that that's, we're lifting them up as activists, but the we that's doing that is we're empowering the local people that are their parents and grandparents to be able to do that. So we've learned as good organizers that you have to learn the language and swim in the water that the fish are in that you're trying to work with. And so that's a, a kind of a organizer 102 class that we uh, will get to sometime. Robert? And I see Lewis has his hand up. Did you want to ask him to that as well? Yeah, I made a note to this earlier, and it may address Cecil's question. What continues to strike me is during the Reconstruction period, when we actually expanded democracy to include more people, you know, particularly African-American free slave, we had a much more progressive agenda. Public education, when I learned that from Ann Braden, I didn't, she would say this, and I didn't quite know all the details of the history, but we, there's many things that white people should be thanking that period for, which particularly poor white folks, which is that the more we uh, pull the blanket of democracy down to cover all the feet in the bed, the more warmth and the more progress that is shown uh, for all of our society. And I don't remember exactly, but even in this 
this set of studies beyond education, some might help me, but we were just having a lot more, I forgot if there was better health care, but it was probably all that kind of stuff because you had the full mix of people discussing what was their interest and then they had a voice. It seems almost so obvious that we forget it. But anyway, I found it very striking and useful for me as we, and we see why much, how much and why the Republicans, and which to me includes most of the Democrats because it's the corporate parties, are so afraid of full democratic participation. The Republicans distinguish themselves with their voter suppression, just transparent efforts that they continue. But I think the Democrats, the corporate Democrats are truly afraid of meaningful democracy because it shifts from uh, the sucking of the wealth by the one or one tenth of one percent so that there's some benefit for all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, that's, that's a really good point that I think Lewis has brought up. And one last thing I'll say about your question too in terms of the good moments in South Carolina's history, um, what you tend to notice that really derails those moments is that the progressive wing of South Carolina's politics, whether it's the Reconstruction Era Republicans or the Richard Manning administration or the human rights movement in the state, what often derails them is that they can only stay unified for so long before the conservative part of the South of South Carolina gets unified. For example, Reconstruction is a great example of this. From about 1868 to 1872 or so, all the momentum for change in the state was coming from radical Republicans. Um, it was coming from African Americans in particular. But from 1872 onward, uh, the conservative Democrats in South Carolina, they, they needed time to basically get themselves back together again after the Civil War. And the first few years of the Reconstruction government, white Democrats did not even participate via voting, they didn't participate in state office. And then once they began to do so, and they began to coalesce around this idea of redemption, they did so at the same time as the state Republican Party was actually split in two uh, between a reformist wing and the radical wing. Because the reformists thought that the black Republicans were too corrupt, they thought they didn't know the precepts of good government, et cetera. While the black Republicans were saying, well, reformers, you guys are selling us out too much. You're not doing enough to help. And actually, now that I say that, it's kind of what Lewis was just saying about modern day politics. It was just in a reconstruction era context. Um, but I, I think that's, that's something that we'll keep in mind because we don't want the class to seem as though it is um, doom and gloom every single week in terms of people's history. There are hopeful moments. And I think the key for all of us is to figure out what do we take from those hopeful moments to, to learn here and now? That was the point of my question. I, I didn't take the course as doom and gloom. Uh, uh, just living in South Carolina is enough of uh, that kind of education. But, uh, but in the work that I do, it's, um, it's instructive to go through this process of appreciative inquiry in order to identify the strategies and tactics that somebody at some point employed to make some step in the right direction. And we don't want to lose what those strategies and tactics were in the atmosphere in which they were employed, uh, because uh, we might be able to, to recreate that atmosphere and, uh, and train people up in the way that they should go. Robert, before we go on, I want to mention to the students, if they feel a response, don't wait for Robert or I or to respond. Y'all speak up. But the, the, the appreciative inquiry is something that I've been wanting to do, and this could be a project coming out of this class, is to look at the, the list of people, the, the young people, that in 1946 participated in the Southern Negro Youth Congress leadership schools, training schools. Th that was a, an anti-imperialist um, doctrine they had. I mean, they were well ahead of uh, where their grandparents are now. I mean, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren. And, and Walterboro and uh, Orangeburg, we've got, uh, I think it's 10 or 11 towns that Majeska helped seed youth groups. And 400 young people from South Carolina were delegates at the 1946 convention in Columbia. And I know for a fact, we got a copy of the um, 
the booklet that was passed out as a magazine with all kind of cool stuff in it that is uh, the, of the program of the event. And I have showed it to some people that I know my age, older people in Columbia, that didn't know that their parents or grandparents, well, my age would have been parents, were actually, it actually either had advertisements for their business in the program or were at the program and that how quickly that was lost within families. And so that going into Walterboro and trying to write, find these people and, and find out what they're thinking and did they know would be a really, a really interesting project. So move it along, Robert. All right. Okay, so um, let's see. Now, for those of you who've just joined us, what we're doing today is we're asking students, what are some of the things that you have learned that have surprised you about the state's history? Uh, what are some of the things you'd like to see improved in the class? This is a chance to get some, some great feedback. Um, and I'm just randomly picking folks right now um, but certainly, if you have something to add, just, just go ahead and, and speak up. Um, but I want to want to actually move now to Tiffany. Um, I wanted to see if you had anything to say about what you've learned in the class or what you'd like to see in the class so far. Well, being from Florida, and I, one of the primary reasons that I was um, here was to learn more about South Carolina, I was really surprised how much history um, was tied in between the two states, how much history I already knew because I knew about Florida history and I was just learning from a different perspective from South Carolina history. And actually, I just Googled a list of famous people from South Carolina and I found out that um, uh, Mary Bethune, um, Mary McLeod Bethune, uh, who founded uh, Bethune-Cookman College is actually from South Carolina. She's considered a very famous Floridian. So, um, you know, there's a lot of intersectionality going on there just between states, which I think is, is awesome. As far as what I would, I would like to see different, um, I, I'm teaching a class right now for work on knowing what your rights are as a person with a disability and knowing what your history is as a person with a disability. And I am constantly reminded that our history has been whitewashed in terms of ableism. So right now we're learning an alternative kind of history of South Carolina to fill in the gaps of where it was whitewashed for race, and that's where that term comes from, right? But we're still not learning about the true roles of where people were discriminated against based on disability, where people have had to fight for their rights for disability, who are the people who helped, who had disabilities, and that's so important because so much of that history is simply missing and we have to go and find it. And it's also really important because we have to start acknowledging the disability minority as the minority that it is and acknowledging our culture as a culture. And so when you start presenting disability history, then you can start acknowledging disability art and disability literature and disability culture on all different levels, but it starts just like it starts with every other minority with the history. So I would really like to see, and I would be more than happy, hap, I would be more than happy to help, that was a difficult sense, um, you know, to, to work to figure out what that history is and how to fill in the blanks. But I think that it's an essential thing to say, you know, that we need to start filling in that ableism and where that ableism was combated and where it still needs to go. Because, you know, there's a long, long history there and there's a long way to go there. Uh, thanks so much for that. No, that's, that's a really great point. Um, and I think Becky has something she can add to that as well about how we deal with disability studies in particular and disability in history. 
Yeah, Tiffany, I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I happened to work on something just about a month ago, working on a profile about Harriet McBride Johnson, who um, was a disability activist um, who was involved with the network, actually got a, one of our um, Thunder and Lightning Awards in, I don't know, something like 2006 or something like that. Um, and she, learning about her, so I knew her a little bit through that, but when I really researched the things that she had done, and she's left a body of work that's really um, just fantastic. And so I've did, done like a four-page spread on her and collected a bunch of her works that I was telling Brett earlier um, after doing it, that it really needed to be incorporated into the class because um, she has really specific, organize, really practical and pragmatic and useful tools for um, disability activists that are good and solid advice for anybody that's doing work in South Carolina. She understood the system. She was a lawyer. She was a fantastic writer, just a really elegant writer. Um, and then she left a series of videos that I would invite, that I would offer a link to. That's just, they're, they're just really charming and smart. And um, so anyway, I'm, I'm babbling on, but I just really appreciate your um, nudging us in that direction because we've, we've done a really poor job of understanding and involving um, that community. And I think we can all learn and um, be richer for, for that effort. Becky, I'm going to put my email address in the chat box. Can you, can you send me any resources you have on that? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you so yeah. much. Sure. All right. Okay, so let's see. Who is going to be the next participant um, slash victim of our conversation this evening? Um, all right. Julia. Julia Dawson, do you have anything that you've learned from the class so far or anything you'd add to the class so far? So much. So um, I had never heard of, I believe it's something, something Guadalpe, that place in near Georgetown um, where there was a colonial, a Spanish colonial uh, settlement, uh, to use their euphemism, um, that was uh, ended because of a mutiny of enslaved, uh, formerly enslaved Africans. Um, you know, so starting from night one, I mean, huge, you know, and as a social studies teacher myself, who is constantly looking for, you know, um, I say when I'm working, there's also for people who are interested, several groups in town and nationally that are working on education justice issues. And this one group in particular addresses anti-blackness in education. And um, so again, you know, would love to connect anyone who's interested um, in, in ridding education of anti-blackness um, with, these, with these wonderful groups. But we talk about how oftentimes in the um, study and teaching of history, there are absolutely sins of commission, but there are also many sins of omission. And so this whole class every single week is, um, has brought up for me everything that is left out of um, what we have been taught, not just in South Carolina, but across this country. And then also the political agenda behind that, because it's not, um, it's not just people forgetting to, to include certain things. So um, I would say some of the most you know, powerful lessons that come from this class is over and over again, um, the stories of resistance to oppression um, from um, Black people, from Native Americans, from, from any person who is experiencing it. Um, you know, those are huge takeaways and, and I'm, I'm going to have to watch again the recorded sessions, you know, just to even remember in the study guides, which I'm glad that y'all have provided, to continue to really plumb through that history and then continue to apply it in the classroom and everywhere else. So, you know, I can't speak enough to how much um, I've gained and I'm gaining. Um, in terms of what I'd like to continue to see, 
Um, I guess just continuing to lift up that history is not about the people whose names that we remember, you know, the people who are quote unquote famous. I mean, it's not to belittle them, but history is all of us. And um, in fact, Angela Davis was on a Facebook Live last week and she was asked to name one uh, black woman that um, she wanted to share with the group. And instead she said, you know what? I wanna lift up all women of color who have been unnamed in history who fought for freedom like the women of the Montgomery bus boycott who weren't didn't make it into the history books and so i think to continue to to challenge um even like the actual um you know the way that history is written to still reinforce an individualistic hierarchical um, notion of who's important and who isn't and who has agency and who's an actor and who isn't. Um, you know, I would just like to see that continue in, in the Majeska school um, too, you know, um, so to continue to talk about those people that don't, don't make it into the history books. And then in terms of um, other things that I would like to see, I have a couple, I won't go into all of it here. Um, but one is, you know, several times I've actually taken myself off camera because I've gotten extremely emotional, whether it's anger or tears or, or whatever the emotion is, but I did not feel comfortable and didn't want, um, and, and I think that's, I'm not apologizing for that. I didn't, I just didn't want to share that in a public space, but what I would offer is to, if I'm not the only one who has had you know, some intense emotional responses to some of the things shared for different reasons, I would offer to the group to consider, um, you know, giving attention and some kind of process to the emotional impact of what we're learning about. And it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, I don't think it has to be major shifts um, it could be something as simple as, um, for example, before the first class, just an acknowledgement that some of the stories that might be shared either by facilitators or guest speakers will include language like the N-word and people won't say the N-word. And that may bring up a lot of emotion and a range of emotions for different people. Um, like sort of like preparing people for the emotional intensity of this, not to mitigate it, but actually to address it in an even more explicit way, if that makes sense. Um, uh, and also I think to engender, to, to cultivate trust um, and maybe even give people like a minute to say, you know, is there anybody who is not comfortable you know, with certain things. I mean, there's also a practice in, in actual political organizing, specifically around racism and um, sexism and other of the isms, where there are actually like grounding agreements that a group um, looks at together and discusses or raises concerns about before certain conversations are had. And so, um, you know, I wonder if that's something that uh, other people would, um, you know, I wonder if that's something that, that the Majeska School would, um, you know, that would improve it, make it even better than it already is. And then one last thing, um, Brett, your breadth of knowledge and experience is so wide and deep that I would suggest instead of trying to sort of uh, put it in each session in terms of like inviting you to speak, actually giving you one session to address, you know, like to talk about your story, like have you as a guest speaker. And then on the flip side of that, you know, I'm going into my sixth year as a middle school teacher. If the criticism Five, over five years has been that there's not enough room for the for we the participants to interact. What that also does is if you Brett um, sort of shift your role as a facilitator and intent and, and instead come on as a guest speaker and devote an entire session 
to sharing your um, particular story, then the space that that opens up in the weekly um, in the weekly dialogue, my guess is that similar to myself and my in teaching, when I step back and even just be with the silence for like ten, you know, they teach us like don't jump into a silence when when students don't talk to actually like let it go 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Um, I think, you know, what my being tells me is that actually that will engender more discussion amongst the participants, but there will still be a dedicated space for you to share your wisdom and wealth of experience with the group. So those are just a couple of ideas, you know, take them or leave them um, you know, I, I have more, but, uh, I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Thank you. Julie. Uh, and I'm very grateful. Yeah. To be here and to everybody. So thank you. Oh, thanks so much for that. No, those were all very valuable suggestions. Um, and I, I do think, you know, what, what you've said about how we can ground the class and get people prepared emotionally and mentally for it is, is apt. And yeah, you're exactly right. Brett has a lot of, of stories that he's not even really shared with this class. As of yet, there's a lot of things that, you know, due to time constraints, we can't get into, but you're exactly right. I, I do think one unique element of the Majestic School, just speaking as a historian, is that you have people participating in the school who were around for some of these events, uh, who were participants in some of these events. And that's not something that you can just take for granted. Um, and certainly I think it is, it is worth thinking about how we can incorporate more of Brett's experiences into the class overall in a way that's more holistic, that makes more sense in terms of the kinds of classes we're doing. All right, so let's see. Um, Okay, I want to now. I want to hear from Dr. Goldman. I want. I want to hear what you have to say about how the class has gone so far. What you've enjoyed about the class. What are some things you might add to it, and so forth. Well, I've enjoyed the class actually because it is uh, shed some light on the history of my state that that I didn't know, and uh, it has provided me an opportunity to look at some of that history from different perspectives. Um, uh, the history that I have been concentrating on most of my life is history from an African-centered perspective. And as we know, um, history is really not objective. Uh, was it Napoleon that said history is written by the winners? So, um, a lot of, of, of what we're getting is history that uh, is being told from a certain perspective. Um, uh, one of the things that, that I found to be very useful, even though it's very tedious in looking it up, are the what's known as the slave narratives. Uh, and there's a whole volume of narratives from South Carolina. And uh, I think that, that those are very instructive, especially the ones in which the people are obviously afraid to tell the truth. Um, the other thing that, uh, that, that crosses my mind at this time is just the uh, the idea of the various methods of resistance that the enslaved and oppressed Africans used. Um, there were far more rebellions than are uh, recorded. Um, and uh, I think, uh, what is that book uh, on slave rebellion by the the um, the leftist historian, I'm, I'm blocking the name of it. 
I think you're thinking of uh, Herbert Apthecker's American yeah. Negro Slave Revolts. Right, right. And that only scratches the surface, actually. Um, I have a good friend of mine who is uh, originally from Georgetown, South Carolina, who was telling me about a slave revolt that occurred there that I could find nowhere documented. And it was passed down to him through his family um, in, in great detail. So I, I'd like to do more in terms of, of looking at the fact that uh, these Africans didn't just tuck their tails and accept their lot. Uh, that there were multiple methods of resistance, uh, both passive and active. Um, uh, when we get into, uh, my special interest is the 19th century. I, I am fascinated with um, the 19th century from an African uh, perspective, African center perspective. But when we get into what the historian Rayford Logan calls the Nadir, which is the, the era after 1876, 1877. Uh, the Red Summer is another particular interest of mine that I really think needs to be uh, looked at with a, with a, a broader, uh, a more powerful microscope because it's, it's always interesting to me, and I may have said this before, that um, so often when we hear uh, race riot, we think in terms of what happened in the 60s. And we look at uh, Black folk reacting to something that had happened, the 60s, 70s, 80s. The original race riots were uh, murder squads of whites that used to go around picking on, on Blacks. In the rare summer, the summer of 1919, um, is a, a, a very good example of that when uh, the uh, African-American soldiers were turning from World War I after fighting for freedom and found that they had none. Uh, and when the attempts were being made to put them in their place, they actually fought back. And I think that's a, an extremely important thing. Um, one area in particular is Charleston. Uh, that was almost an ongoing guerrilla warfare there. So uh, the, I probably will think of something later on. But those are some things that I just wanted to bring up at this point. Uh, thanks so much. And no, I, I agree with you that the, the Red Summer is a particularly interesting moment in, in both South Carolina and U.S. history in general. Um, because as you say, you know, there are, there are, there's combat in the streets of Charleston and Chicago, um, Washington, D.C., other parts of the country between these, what you, what you basically say were exactly right, these, these roving death squads of, of white racists going out and murdering black people all over the country. Um, in fact, many would tell you that the worst race riot of that Red Summer was actually in a place in Arkansas, Elaine, Arkansas, which was this, this small town. And it actually links up a lot of what we talked about. In, in Elaine, Arkansas, I don't want to go too far in the hole for this, but I do want to kind of briefly mention it. In Atlanta, Arkansas in 1919, um, what happened was you had people there who were trying to organize the sharecroppers, who were mostly African-American, to basically organize for their labor rights. The people who were coming in, um, they were representing a share, an attempt at a sharecropper's union. They were being labeled as communists and socialists. Now, of course, throughout American history, that label is thrown around all the time. It's like a, almost like a constant refrain of the right, that if anybody is trying to fix American society, they must be a communist or a socialist. But what made that charge particularly damaging in 1919 is that's around the same time as the Russian Revolution, the Russian Civil War. And so the threat of communism 
seemed real to many Americans. They were afraid that there was this, this contagion of radicalism coming in from Russia and Eastern Europe that was going to spread across Western Europe into the United States. And they thought it was going to come through African Americans. In fact, really quickly, um, there are actually images you can find from the Great War era in American newspapers where editors are writing about their fears of during the Great War of Germans coming to the U.S. to to push blacks to fight against the U.S. government. And then in 1919, it turns into communists coming over to turn blacks against the U.S. government. Because in 1918, 1919, what possible reason could black people have to dislike the U.S. government or their local or state governments? But in Elaine, Arkansas, you have what turns into this, this huge racial conflagration where the, the casualty numbers are still uncertain, but we're pretty sure hundreds of African Americans were killed in Elaine, Arkansas in 1919. Not, not tens or dozens, hundreds. And when I, when I teach, for example, um, African American history or civil rights and black nationalism in Claflin, the 1919 to 1929 period in particular is incredibly bloody because you have the Red Summer Riots of 1919. You have uh, the destruction of Rosewood, Florida in 1923. You have the Tulsa race riot, race riot in 1921 or so. You have all these different moments in the 1920s where attempts at African-American economic independence are annihilated by whites in the area. And so it helps to explain why the generation of activists in the 1920s are so radicalized. And then going forward, why you have African Americans dabbling in socialism or communism or some other forms of radicalism that are designed to address not just racism, but also economic exploitation as well. So, you know, again, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned these things because, you know, we do want to make sure that when students come away from our class that even if you don't learn absolutely everything there is to learn, you will at least have the curiosity to go out and use the study guide and use other sources to kind of find information as well. Um, again, so much of this era, you're talking about the nadir of, of American race relations, really helps to illustrate and define where we are now as a country. And, and also it's worth noting there are some incredibly eerie parallels between right now and the, the red summer time period. If I could add one more thing. Sure. Uh, that, uh, someone mentioned earlier, I forget who it was, about the, uh, the, the, the approaches toward race and uh, um, the origins of racism, if you will, and, and how people felt toward that. And I'd like to uh, offer two references that uh, look at that. Um, one book is written by a young scholar today by the name of Ibram Kendi called Stamped from the Beginning. Excellent uh, book. And then one of, one of a person that I consider one of my teachers, uh, Dr. Jacob Carruthers, wrote a book called Intellectual Warfare that I think is also very, very instructive in terms of, of, of everything that's going on. Because one of the questions um, he mentions is that when did the descendants of the Africans who were kidnapped, brutalized, enslaved, and oppressed start to consider themselves American? And for those of you who may be curious, uh, this is the, co the, the cover of that from the beginning. I actually have it in my personal library. Um, the Carruthers book, Intellectual Warfare, I do not have, but one of my colleagues at Claflin I know has it. Um, those are both excellent resources if you're talking about the history of race. Um, I like to also, if you're looking for more sources to, to look at and dive into, um, I'll type this in the comments. There is a book by the historian Nell Irvin, um, uh, Nell Painter, um, called The History of White People. Um, it's, it's actually not quite what you might think because that book actually delves into the idea of whiteness in particular and how even, well, especially within European history, 
how this idea has changed so dramatically over time. Um, and, and one last thing I'll say about the history of race is that um, historians right now, especially those of, of whiteness and those of, of race in particular, they're having this really interesting debate about when racism as we know it actually starts. Um, traditionally in a history, American history course, or European history course, we would kind of trace to the era of the age of discovery of Columbus's um, voyages to, to the new world, European colonization of the Americas, the expansion of the African slave trade, et cetera. But there are some ancient historians who are now pushing back and saying, well, actually, if you look at um, the history of, say, ideas of ethnicity and identity in the Roman Empire, you start to see some ideas about Blackness possibly being seen as inferior or different. Um, you see some of this in the medieval European period as well. Uh, so there, there's a lot still being done with, with where these ideas of race actually come from. And this actually takes me back to Cecil's question a while ago about um, the, the Barbadian context for the Carolina colony versus the Jamestown context of, of race relations and such. And I think part of why that, that, that question is, is such an important one is that ideas about racial identity, even in the 17th century, were not fixed. Um, they were still changing. And, and, there, and, and you know, we've had more time in the class, I would get into how there are examples of, of Europeans in the 17th century speaking out against the African slave trade because they're saying, well, actually, with our Christian doctrine, this is actually a moral wrong. Um, so there, there is, and I think Brett and I have been talking for a while about doing special breakout sessions outside of the normal structure of the class to kind of cover some of these bigger issues. And what I'm hearing from you guys is that there is certainly a hunger for having more spaces like this where we can kind of talk about some of these bigger issues more in depth. Now I want to see, uh, let's see, does anyone else want to, want to volunteer any comments? Um, I, I'm, go ahead, please, Rick, by all means. Uh, I think you're still, you're still muted right now. You're still muted, Rick. Wait, let me, let I got me, you. Let me, You're unmuted. I now. got you. Okay. All right. Um, the, uh, um, I, I've learned a lot, but I'm, I'm still in the process of learning, and this is going to take a long time. Um, I've been in South Carolina for eight years, so pretty much everything other than like the general stuff, like, you know, secession, the Civil War, that's the details are all new to me. So I'm still trying to uh, kind of continue the learning and put the pieces together. Along the way, um, I guess the way I've put them together so far is how uh, the ruling class in South Carolina is kind of a, it makes for an example. It's a microcosm of how a, a you know, almost a textbook um, ruling class rules. Um, some of the ideas that the, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the radicals in, in South Carolina were, were you know, anti-imperial, that they had a, a view, a world view, which really makes a lot of sense. And this is something that, that I, I, I picked up on is that um, being from being from New York, and I have all my little prejudices against South Carolina, but I didn't really recognize them as part of of the the global economy to the extent it was. It's, it starts, you know, you have rice and cotton, you have slave trade, and all that's going across the Atlantic. Um, you go through the textile mills that rose and fell, and now you have, you know, the tire manufacturing, the car manufacturers. So, so the imperialism um is 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 part of South Carolina's history and the uh exploitation that goes along with that is part of South Carolina's history and the way the 
that I was thinking in terms of the ruling class, the ruling class, obviously, they control the politics, they control the law, you control the law, you control the the um, force of this, the state, the violence, they control the National Guard, they control the police, um, the, the ruling class controls the media. So you have, you know, um, Honea Path happens, um, violence of the state and doesn't really get reported. People forget about it. You know, Orangeburg massacre, people kind of forget about it. So it's, it's those, it, it's kind of the, the bigger picture of how South Carolina fits into the global economy and how the South Carolina ruling class um, controls the media, controls the politics, controls the money. Um, much like the ruling class, if you were to think of the, um, the global ruling class, whether it's the capitalist class, however you want to frame it. So that, that's my context right now. And like I said, I'm still trying to, you know, put all the pieces together. So that also leaves me with really no suggestions on, on where this might go, um, because I'm, I'm still trying to absorb it. Oh, thanks so much for that. I mean, yeah, it's it's definitely, I think I, I have to say from the perspective of someone who's teaching the class, it, it is great to know that folks are getting so much out of it and are also asking so many questions after the fact too. Um, I can I can tell all of you, by the way, that one thing to keep in mind about South Carolina's history that makes it so important is that a lot of other professional historians don't know it very well either. I'll, I'll give you a, a direct example of this. About two years ago, Columbia was host to the Urban History Association Conference uh, back in 2018. It was the first time the city had hosted a conference, an academic conference of that size in a long time. Um, and, and two things, were quite clear to me during and after the conference. One, a colleague of mine at USC who was on the planning committee for the event, she told us that when she pushed for Columbia to host it, uh, a colleague of hers said, oh, like, we're gonna host it in Columbia, South Carolina? Basically talking about, thinking about the racism and everything associated with the state and its history. And her response to him was, you're from Chicago. Like what, <laughs> like, you don't have any room to talk about about racism and discrimination, segregation without critiquing your own city directly. But more to the point, I, I actually led a tour during the conference of Lower Richland. And it was like a, a walking slash driving tour of the area. And I told most of the historians there about what we mentioned in this class, the, um, the South Carolina Land Commission, the attempt to reallocate land to poor people black and white in the state. Now, again, many of the Urban History Association participants are historians who study not just urban America, but they study the intersection of race and class and economics, uh, gender and race and class and so on and so forth. Not, none of them had ever heard of the Land Commission. And these are people who study uh, race relations, they study the left, they study all these different topics, and they admitted they had just never heard of it before because South Carolina, when you look at the nation's history as a whole. South Carolina occupies this odd space where on the one hand, it is directly minimized. And yet you cannot really imagine talking about the nation's history without talking about a John C. Calhoun or a Strom Thurmond or theories of nullification and so forth. Things that have their origins in South Carolina. And so I, I think the Majeska School is at least our attempt on a local level to kind of mitigate some of those things that are left out of the history books, even within South Carolina itself. Uh, so I'm glad that you, you mentioned, all of you mentioned how much you learned from the class and how much you want, you want to get out of the class too. Okay, so Brett. You know, Robert, since uh, this isn't a history lesson, but it, this is an organizer training school, um, it's important that we have that element in there. We're not just talking about history, and, and Rick has been helping us doing uh, civic engagement and uh, election analysis and things. But without the understanding of the peculiar way that South Carolina elections have been set up by the Jim Crow Constitution of 1895, 
you can't effectively perform today. And so that's what we're trying to do is connect that lessons learned from the past with the work we do today for a better future. Exactly. All right, please go ahead. Uh, I, I see Gareth Finley is, is raising her, her hand too. Go, go ahead, please. Hi, um, I'm Gareth. Um, I'm a 2016 graduate of the Majeska Simpkins School. And um, I really loved what Brett just, Brett just chimed in saying it. It's an organizer training school, <laughs> not only um, a history lesson, but the history aspect is, um, is the fertile ground for our organizing. And my favorite time in history is right now, whatever day it is, that's my favorite time in history. Um, I want to get things moving in the right direction. I want to be organizing. And I liked, um, I was like, I've been taking notes while people have been talking. Um, Julie Dawson, I wanted to thank you for um, talking about um, the people who are working for injustice who didn't get a starring uh, famous place in the history books. That's me. I've been working as a social justice warrior for all these, um, you know, 40 years so far and, um, and started out with the, um, what started as the gay rights movement now, LGBTQ, but it was all about me, right? Cause hey, you know, it affected me personally. But over the years, I really came to believe that um, the problem of the color line was not only the, the main problem of the 20th century, as W.E.B. Du Bois said, but um, you know, racism and racial oppression is, uh, is, is the problem of the 21st century. So um, I just wanted to say, I'm so excited that the Majeska Simpkins School continues. And when I took the, the class in 2016, um, each of us had to have a project and mine was called the Permanence Project. And my idea was to be part of the supporting cast of uh, the Progressive Network to help um, square away some of the um, behind the scenes organizational stuff that nobody wants to deal with, you know, kind of the stuff, the legal framework, the, you know, the budget, the money, um, all that other stuff, um, and try to, um, ensure the ongoing permanence of the South Carolina Progressive Network because it refreshes me so much to be with y'all, uh, my people, people working on uh, racism and oppression in, in South Carolina and in the South um, toward a more beloved community. And um, I'm kind of entering chapter two of the Permanence Project now, um, working with Brett and the board and others on uh, the grow building and the um, the grow building as a as a location um, owned by the South Carolina Progressive Network right next door to Majeska Simpkins own home and um, the home of um, social justice in South Carolina so it's really exciting to be here and um, I just put in a word for anything to do with organizing <laughs> organizing thanks for listening to me Oh, thanks so much. I mean, those are those are great comments as well. And and in particular, what you pointed out about how the main objective of this course is to tie the history to the here and now. Um, I think that's particularly important um, because a lot of a lot of what happens in terms of thinking about social activism in American history is the the day to day nuts and bolts of how you keep a movement going and how you, you keep things fresh, how you keep people engaged. Um, I can tell you, for example, that, that two individuals that come to mind as personal heroes of mine and historical figures who are incredibly important, um, but weren't actually very good at, at organizing were Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. I mean, they were both, and Dr. Shaw's like, <laughs> I can see, <laughs> he knows exactly what I'm talking about. They were, they were men who are, well remembered by history now, uh, even though during their lifetimes we were both hated and, and spat upon by many Americans. But if you look at their biographies, their big Achilles heel for both of them was actually organizing. 
um, in, in a way that if you look at the organizations they work with, a lot of the nuts and bolts of organizing was done by others, uh, or it was better done by others. Uh, and that's not, that's not to say they were, they were terrible leaders. It's just saying that part of activism and part of its history is understanding what people's strengths uh, and weaknesses are. Um, and I stuff the show. I, I would agree with that. I think Malcolm X was was slightly better at, at organizing than Dr. King was. But the thing about history is this, um, as Julia and others have pointed out, so much of the history we know today is shaped by the history we do not know from yesterday. It's shaped by the people who left sources behind and then by the folks who did not leave sources behind or whose, whose sources have yet to be uncovered. Um, think about this in the here and now. I, I joke with my students at Claflin all the time that, you know, what you're posting on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or et cetera today um, could be very well a primary source for the future, which absolutely terrifies me. But at the same time, even today, there are so many people whose voices we just don't hear, uh, whether it's folks who, who may not be engaged in voting or may not be engaged in activism or have just dropped off the grid a number of ways. Uh, there are so many stories that historians are still struggling to uncover. I mean, to put it in a present day context, I think about the COVID-19 epidemic and how many people are, are suffering right now in a multitude of ways and will continue to suffer for years and decades to come whose stories we may never hear about or whose stories may be minimized, or probably will be minimized. So again, this is, this is a good reminder of, of why we are here in the Majeska School. And, and again, to the comments in the chat, I, I don't want to malign Brother Malcolm. Uh, he was a better organizer than, than Martin Luther King Jr. Um, although I, 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 I also have to say that uh, I, I think both men would, if they were around today, it would be very interesting to pick their brains about where things are, are right now. Um, Lewis, you have something you want to add? I saw your hand was up a moment ago. Thank you. Earlier, the comment was made about the emotional impact of some of this information. And I, re I really appreciate that. And I think it, and, and particularly with the organizing point, how do we get from here to the better place is, that we should let that emotional feeling translate, I believe, to a moral outrage at it. And be careful that the moral outrage doesn't lead us to hatred and anger because who wants an organizer who's filled with hate and anger, but convert that to the love. It's the love for justice, the love for the people that have hurt and bled and died and don't have food to eat that we convert to give us the energy to keep the chin up, to keep hope alive and, and, and keep fighting. Thanks. Dr. Green, can I make a comment on that too? Um, I, uh, I'm an Arab American. I think I've shared that with you guys before. I'm, I'm Lebanese. And when you're, when you're fair skinned, when you look white, but you're, you're not, you have a very unique perspective on racism um, because the racism you experience is very different. People aren't aggressive towards me or to my family members because we look different or we, they think we are different they're aggressive towards us because they think that we're not different. They talk about other people and they think that they're talking to someone like them. And so I, I've felt both sides of that. I'm very aware of my privilege, um, but I'm also very aware of the emotion. And as a person with a psychiatric disability, I'm very aware of how hard it can be to be overwhelmed with emotion you can't control and not feel like you're in a safe space to express that 
or feel judged. And I, and I preface all of that because I want people to understand that I have empathy when I make my next statement. I think we're getting into a society where we're very concerned about triggering each other to the point where sometimes we do not confront things that need to be confronted. And I hear Julia's concerns, and I'm looking at you right now even though you can't tell that I am. I hear, I hear those concerns and I feel that they're valid that a lot of this stuff can impact us on a really deep level. The, the memories that I'm talking about when I'm talking about the racism that I've experienced, they, they hit me on a really deep level. It's hard for me to talk about those things. And, and hearing other people's stories when they're hurt, that hits you on a really deep level. But if we don't deal with those emotions, if we don't confront that, if we don't hear those stories, if we don't say those words, the R word in the disability community, if we, do, if we don't hear that people use that slur, if we don't hear those words, then we can't stop it from happening again. And I wanna be, I want to be careful and I want us as a community of activists to be careful that we don't sugarcoat things so much that the following generations are doomed to repeat the past mistakes because they forget that the past mistakes happen. And I'm starting to see that. I taught history last year to sixth graders too. And I'm starting to see that they, they forget that bad things happened and they don't know that they're coming. And I think that's how we ended up in our current situations in a lot of ways in the first place. Sorry, that's my soapbox. Please excuse me. Yeah, can I respond me. since you called my name? Please go right ahead. Yeah, no, I appreciate. And I think this is the kind of space where, you know, it's like we get to both clarify if I feel like I, you know what I mean? Like, because maybe um, what I was communicating is something different from what you heard. And so I really appreciate, you know, you calling out my name specifically. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't saying that I think we should censor. And so if I, if that is what came across, that's not what I'm suggesting because I have, a respect for PC, you know, like the attention to language, but then I also absolutely see your point that you just shared. Um, and I really appreciate how you, you know, everything that you just shared. My request or question is to even just have like a mention of, hey, we're gonna be talking about stuff that is normally not talked about. People are going to say, you know, this is not the type of, this is not like your uh, South Carolina standards, professional development that those of you who are, you know, this, like, this is a different space just to acknowledge that and sort of prepare people for that. Not, um, not censor. Does that make sense? To actually maybe even give people a chance to have the kind of conversation we're having right now at the front end. No, that, those are some, uh, those are some really fascinating takes on, on what we can do in this school in terms of not just talking about the history, we're talking about the here and now. Um, so I think in, in reference to that, because I do have a, a personal perspective on that too, I want to add later on in the class, but I wanted to ask uh, Reverend Barnes if you had anything you wanted to, to kind of share with the class right now as well. Well, I, I am grateful to be involved um, in the discussion that we're having. I am challenged in a lot of ways in terms of continuing to hear the stories and how these stories impact how we live our lives from day to day. Um, several months ago, some of my cl clergy colleagues, we got together and we started reading the book, Trouble I've Seen, Changing the Way 
The Church Views Racism by Drew G.I. Hart. And in that discussion, we began to talk about issues of racism specifically in the church and how that um, impacts how we live out our ministry. So as we were discussing some of the issues here in the class, you know, I realized how, how difficult it is to talk about issues that impact us day to day. And it's easier to be in denial, if you will, about the issues. And therefore, it appears to me we live our lives as if these things did not happen. Um, specifically, um, you know, we talk about terrorists and we talk about those kinds of issues. But if you ask someone in the Black community, um, African Americans have been terrorized you know, all of their lives. And so to hear again, some of the issues about the massacres that have taken place um, in our country that we don't hear much about at this time has led me um, as a pastor specifically, you know, as a pastor to realize how in denial we are and that we really don't want to hear it. I pastor a, um, a predominantly Caucasian church, and just to mention some times of issues, you know, send them really, you know, um, that's the past. We don't want to talk about it. And, and I think that for, for me um, creates some of the, the animosity, animosity that we have going on. If we can be angry enough to keep the conversation going past you know, where we have the blockage to get to a place, you know, where we, where we have commonality, but too often just the emotions, you know, come to the surface and it blocks us being able to continue to have the discussion. So I'm grateful to be a part of the class because it has opened for me again, a space to be able to talk and to hear about these issues that I cannot or have not, I shouldn't say I cannot, I have not found the space yet to have the discussions, conversations um, in my local church. So I do believe that I'm in a place where I can begin to, to have the conversation. But I do wanna make a suggestion as it relates to the class, you know, recognizing also that it is a class that has to do with organizing, you know, the, the, the syllabus is quite extensive in terms of what it's being presented. So as I'm reviewing for the class, I'm going through this syllabus and not exactly sure what we are going to hear. You know, I mean, it's just so extensive. So in my mind, I am thinking if, if, if the goal is to get to this project, then maybe there needs to be an outline as to what we're going to cover, then to have a space like we're having now to discuss, you know, what we have learned or shared in this class and how this will contribute to when we're getting to our project. For me, I think there are times that I'm just kind of overwhelmed. Oh my God, oh my God. Um, the, the, the magnitude of, of what's here, but having the syllabus helps to go back and to refresh and to learn more. But for the purpose of the class, it would be helpful to perhaps maybe have an outline and have before the, the session is over to have what we're doing now to talk about what we've discussed in this session and how it may contribute to our project at the end. Um, that being said, I, I want to conclude by saying what we're discussing here, you know, teachers and the various positions where we are, that we take forth an opportunity to have the discussion, the larger discussion um, with those in those uh, spaces uh, where we work and live.
so that the message doesn't die on the Zoom or in this recording so that we can impact the society even greater. This pandemic has opened the door again for the inequities, um, the inequalities that continue to go on in our country. And the voices to me are being stifled because we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. And I, you know, I don't know who said it, but you know, we, yes, we are going to feel some emotions. And, and I would agree with you, Julie, that perhaps at the beginning, there needs to be some preface about this is real life and you may have these emotions, but that's a part of learning and growing. And, and I just want us to be the catalyst to really begin to make some impact, more impact. I know we're making some, I don't want to be in denial about that, but more impact because if we don't, we're going to continue to have even greater inequality. The gap is going to be widened versus um, closing, closing the gap. So I end with that. Thank you. As an aside, if I could mention something you mentioned the, <clears throat> the terrorism that's felt by uh, African people in America uh, on a daily basis. And just as an aside, I used to do a radio program. Uh, in fact, I did it for over 20 years uh, weekly, uh, talking about history, culture, uh, current events, and the like. And right after uh, 911, right after that happened, uh, we had a discussion about how uh, Black folk had been terrorized since we'd been here, and that terrorist organizations such as the Ku Klux Klan, the White Citizens Council, uh, went unscathed. And we were kicked off the radio. <laughs> we had to, had to find another radio station shortly after that. And it's very interesting because of the way that people look at that. Um, Robin D'Angelo, is it, wrote the book called White Fragility, which is a very, very, very interesting book. She makes it plain that she's not writing it for Black folk. But then we, I think someone mentioned a little earlier that, that people forget about the Orangeburg Massacre. But Black folks don't forget about the Orangeburg Massacre. Uh, that's something that, that if you live through that time, then you, you, you never forget that. Uh, and if you had people who were involved or affected by that, even that's even more so a reason that we never forget it. But it's not taught so that uh, our children are not being taught that, so they will forget. And that's, uh, you know, part of, that's part of, of, of one of the reasons that, that I want to learn how to organize people to become more interested in, in their history. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. I've, I've known both of them, Reverend Barnes and Bernie Goldman, since I didn't have gray hair. And that one of the things that, the reason that we're calling this thing the Majeska School is the fighting spirit of this woman who was literally thrown out of every, every organization she was in that I can recall, uh, or the organizations were destroyed by repression. And that I remember having a conversation with her probably 30 years ago, about I can't remember who it was I was gonna alienate or make mad. And she told me, she said, Lord, if I was worried about what people thought about me, I'd never get anything done. And so one of the really compelling attributes of a revolutionary has to be presumption. You've got to presume that what you're feeling and, and trying to communicate is worth speaking up for, even if it makes you seem like you're an outlier. And that I, I distinctly recall in the 60s when the Vietnam War was cranking up and our analysis, the anti-imperialist analysis that W.E.B. Du Bois had and Majeska had, was that America's kind of classical proletariat, the working class that we were oppressing, had been offshore. It was third world colonies that we had. And as we were losing the colonies, that oppression came closer to home and to the black communities that have always been oppressed, 
and that the thing that was protecting people that were white, especially white middle-class males, was privilege of being white middle-class male Americans. And so denying that privilege, um, it's a challenging thing. I mean, you end up in prison, you get beat up, and, and you're probably not as likely to be killed as your black comrades that are doing the same thing. But folks, there's, there's a war in this world, and it depends which side of the line you're on. And that the progressive network, one of the things we do in the Majeska School is we talk about, or, or do you understand that what we're talking about is revolutionary? And what is your commitment to living those values? And Connie, you're right. We need to have something that scares people off in the beginning <laughs> so they understand where we're going with this. Because really, really, they're, they're killing people for money. And that's wrong. And somebody's got to do something about it. And I'm committed to doing it. And a lot of other folks are. And I hope uh, the 20 of you that are still with us this evening are. So stay tuned. And <laughs> I apologize that class seven, our next class, is um, starts with the beginning of the Progressive Network. And so I will probably be your main speaker next class, next Monday. Robert, it's 8.02. We've got a little time if people have some things to say. Oh, please, by, by all means, if anybody has anything they, they wish to add, um, because we, we are having a really good uh, conversation here this evening. I, I didn't want, again, I don't want to pick on anybody, but I, I did want to pick Dr. Shaw's brain for a quick second, because I've noticed uh, you've been very engaged with the conversation. I wanted to see if you had anything to add about um, what you'd like to see out of the class, what you've learned from participants in the class, and so forth. Well, uh, Robert, in the, in the spirit of, um, of lessons um, taken from uh, mother and father spirit activists, sometimes it is best for an organizer to listen um, than to, <laughs> to speak out. Uh, you get gain a lot from listening. Um, I will say that um, this has been a, you know, and, and, and I listen in part because there's, there's um, ways in which um, I have come to love my, um, my, my adopted home of South Carolina um, and understand aspects of um, the political history and culture here uh, that, that there's sort of this sense I've gotten since I've gotten here of there's a lot of history that somebody's afraid uh, to know. <laughs> uh, and so, but that lot of history also links very much in the realm of this, of this school to, you know, but part of the reason why it's um, quote unquote, someone's afraid to know or to go back to Rick's point about the aristocracy or elite afraid for people to know because it it, it, it it troubles the water right um, and and our and our and, and one part of the myth about South Carolina is you know we, we know how to not trouble the water here uh, unlike uh, places that are messier um, having said that um, I, 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 there's one thing that I will uh, hopefully add as a contribution to the conversation in saying that um, I Although I don't always agree, there are ways in which I, my reading of the, of the author, Ta-Nehisi Coates, sort of provokes my thought. Um, and he, um, in some of his essays, including uh, Between the World and Me, talks about, um, it's a provocative idea, and he's what we would sort of term as a Afro-pessimist. Uh, but it's a provocative idea to say that hope is a luxury. Um, now, Hope is a luxury in the sense, and he, and he says that not because ultimately he doesn't have hope, but it's he starts with a proposition to say, we, don't, we have to earn our hope, right? Um, in the sense that we, we know this history, we, you, know, you, know, um, you know what a Majeska Simpkins sacrificed and did. You know what an Ella Baker sacrificed and did. You're aware of the struggles, you're aware of the barriers, you're aware, you're aware of you know, the strategy. Then it's time to be hopeful once you have um, really, you know, rolled up your 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 um, uh, sleeves and 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 gotten to work in some respects. But to simply to have hope and to say, oh well, it's all going it's going to turn out all right. Well, how how committed are you to it turning out all right? As as, as I have been told, and I you know that there's times in which, um, in, in various ways, both as a scholar and as a scholar activist, I've been told things about myself and I have to stop and say, and say hey, what, what should I be doing 
to, 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 to make a real contribution and not just say, well, it's going to work out. So anyway, I mean, I think, I don't want to say that uh, to, to, to dampen anyone's spirit in any way, shape or form. Uh, but that's, that's one thing I kind of meditate on is, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, have I earned my hope? <laughs> you know, have I done what I should do uh, in, in, in order to really say I am hopeful? And I'm hopeful because I have a concrete vision of faith. And, and I don't take anything away from that at all. I'm a person of faith. But, have I, but I have I really earned my hope by the work I've done. And I think each of us are making a, a valuable contribution in that direction in being engaged in this work and in this school. So I'll just offer that and, and leave it there for what, for what it's worth. <laughs> no, uh, thanks for that. And I, and I think you're, you're exactly right that, to think about how the very meaning of hope and an earned hope is important to what we're talking about in this class. Now, as someone who is an Atlanta Braves fan, Atlanta Falcons fan, sometimes all I have is hope. But I digress. As a historian, though, I always tell my students at Claflin, and I always remind them that when we're talking about, say, activists involved in the civil rights struggle or folks who are involved in other human rights struggles across the world. Many of these people are entering struggles where they don't know what the outcome is going to be. They do not know if the change they want to see in the world will be a change they will actually see in their lifetimes. On the one hand, that can be an incredibly terrifying proposition that you may fight for something year after year decade after decade and not actually see it come to life. But on the other hand, for me, I think that's actually personally enriching because it reminds you that you're doing this not just for yourself, but for people yet to be born, people who may never hear your name, may never know who you are, but in a way you are helping your fellow human being to, um, to really do what can be done to really help um, others, you know, and to, to really think about how all of that is, is incredibly important to what we're doing this evening and what we're going to continue to do as well. Um, so this, this, again, I think sessions like this really help to crystallize what we're trying to accomplish as a school and as an organization more broadly, because as you guys can see, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, to give you an example of the kind of work that not just the network, but activists across the country are gonna to have to be engaged in from here on out. I, I just read an article today that um, the Navajo Nation has the highest per capita rates of COVID-19 infections and deaths more than any American state. Why is that? Why is it that African Americans are dying disproportionately from this virus. Uh, why is it that we are having all these stories and reports of, of, of Black men and women being shot and killed in the street just for jogging or being harassed in their own homes? These are the kinds of things that we need, we need to all think about. And I can tell you from my personal experience, I just want to add this, this really personal story to this because I, I think at times, in a class like this, it, it may seem as though I am simply a history machine talking about this stuff, but it also has a personal impact on me too. Um, uh, for years, for years, I can tell you that whenever I would go out for a walk, even just a simple stroll, I would always watch my surroundings because I always felt I had a reason to do so. Um, not because I don't like being around people, on the contrary, but it's because I always thought that, well, if I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time and I'm seen by the wrong person, who knows what could happen to me. A few years ago, I went to a, a Black Lives Matter protest right here in Columbia, South Carolina. My parents just asked me to be careful. And when they asked me to be careful, I, I knew it wasn't a simple, hey, you know, it's at night, be careful of your surrounding. It was a, hey, as some of you mentioned, we know our history too. Uh, we know our history better than most other people do. 
and anything could happen to you at that protest. And, and in a way, I knew that just being at that protest, I was part of this larger history that I think by all of you being in this class, we're also in, in some way participating in too. Um, I'm not asking you guys to, to be superheroes. I am simply asking all of you to be human beings and to respect one another. And the conversations like this are, are really the kinds of things that we need more of. So anybody else have anything to add this evening? Robert, hearing silence, the sound of silence, I would wrap it up with inviting everybody that's <laughs> tuned in tonight, they may not be getting the Progressive Network emails, uh, that we have our monthly Progressive Network meeting tomorrow night on Zoom at 7 o'clock where we're going to give a, a sample or a, a, a summary of the things that we're doing uh, for 2020 democracy that we have adjusted for the pandemic era. And we, we're doing some things to ensure that we have an open and fair election. Um, and we've got some really good organizing plans. And that is an opportunity to share in an hour, a brief meeting, a summary of what we're doing and then we're tr doing a training sessions for people that want to take a deeper dive on Friday oh, excuse me on Saturday uh, morning and Sunday afternoon for those that's the same session repeated Saturday and Sunday for those that can't make one or the other and that's uh, on our calendar at the network scpronet.com and would encourage you all to see how we take what we're learning here about history and put it into play today and I thank you all for coming, Robert. If you want to give one more chance to say something and wrap it up, we'll be back here same time, same place next Monday. Um, well, there's nothing else for the good of the order. Um, I look forward to seeing you all next week. Um, again, we have a lot to talk about next week with the founding of the Progressive Network and really bringing us up to the present day and the here and now. Um, and the next few class sessions are going to move us from the history of South Carolina to thinking about the theory behind activism and the theory behind organizing and protest that's so important, especially in 2020, as it seems everything around us is falling apart. Um, but that doesn't mean you lose hope. Uh, you simply have to work to make sure that hope is actually earned. Thank you much. That was very helpful to earn hope. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you so Good much. Night. Good night. Thank Good you. Night. Take care. Well. See ya. Stay safe. <laughs> Good night. Oh, there they go. There they go. I'm just watching everybody sign off. I'm still here. You can only get 49 people up at one time. <laughs> I, I think. And I know that John has walked off because that was a woman cleaning his desk that we were saying. I see. Stop. John Ando is a really, really a, a real blessing. Cut the recording. Oh, cut the recording. Cut the recording. Becky's reminding.